is the one that we're interested in now. Uh, but we show different people different things. So person A is not shown anything additional. Uh, person B, we show that one of the uh, remaining three cards is red. And person C, we show that one of the three remaining cards is black. And then we ask, well, what, ask each of these people, well, what is the probability that this card that we pulled out uh, originally uh, is red? Um, so to person A, using just that information, they haven't seen anything additional. They knew that two of the cards were red, two of the cards were black. So two out of four is the same as one half. And so their probability would be about one half. Uh, person B, however, saw that one of the remaining cards was still red. So they know that there's only one remaining uh, red card out of three that we don't know about. Um, and so they would probably say the probability is, is about one third. Person C, who knows one of the remaining is black, and so he knows there's two possibilities for red out of three cards, would say two thirds. And so we have three different people who, even though it's the exact same cir circumstance, have three different probabilities because the probability here is representing their knowledge, not just, um, you know, the state of things sitting here on the table, okay? Uh, now, you can actually bring in other knowledge as well. Uh, so if somebody in seeing me, you know, mix up the cards had noticed that maybe I didn't mix them up very well and they had a pretty good feel for which card I pulled out, uh, they might say, well, you know, I think it's, there's a 70% chance that it's red and 30% chance that it's black because of what they saw. Or, you know, people who have seen me work with cards before and, and know that I dabble in magic might just say, well, there's a, you know, 30% chance it's red, a 20% chance it's black, 25% chance it's blank, and, you know, 25% chance it's green, you know. So, um, you know, you can bring in other knowledge into this as well. But it's kind of representing and thinking about is when we're talking about probability, it does tie in that if we do things over and over and our, you know, probability is correct, the frequentist definition will come out. But in thinking about Bayesian statistics, you know, it's representing what we don't know, not necessarily an exact state of, of nature here, okay? Uh, so in Bayesian statistics, there's kind of, you know, three main steps or, you know, different ways to do that. Uh, but basically, we're going to develop a model of how the data are related to parameters of interest. Now, this is pretty much the same as traditional statistics in a lot of ways. This is just doing something like, I'm going to use the normal distribution. I believe my data comes from a normal distribution with a mean and a standard deviation. Uh, I just don't know what those mean and standard deviation are. But, you know, if we choose a normal distribution, and that's one thing there. Or we might say this is a regression model based on these predictor variables with normal errors. Okay? Um, so that's not too different from what we already do. Uh, it's just kind of focusing there. Then we're going to choose a prior distribution on all of those parameters. Is We're going to start off by saying, well, instead of just saying I don't know anything, we want to focus and say, well, what do I know about, you know, what's feasible values for this mean and standard deviation or for whatever parameters are in there. Um, and so if we have some prior information, uh, prior studies, talking to experts, other things, we can actually bring that in in that prior choosing place, okay? Now, using the, the model here, what we call the likelihood and the prior, we can then compute what we call the posterior distribution, which is basically a a probability distribution on the unknown parameters. So we have a mean of a normal distribution, and the output of the Bayesian techniques is not just, well, here's what I think the mean is, but a whole distribution. It could be this value, it could be any of these values. It's more likely to be these ones in the middle of the distribution and uh, going out with that. And I'll, I'll show examples of that. But then we do our, our inference or interpretation based on that posterior distribution of you know, combining together our prior knowledge and uh, the likelihood with the data uh, to how that updates our prior to give us that posterior distribution. Okay, uh, computing the posterior is kind of the tricky part here, is there's kind of, you know, a, a few different options here. One is that there are some simple and specific models and priors out there for which these calculations are fairly simple and straightforward, okay? Uh, for a long time, that's most of what the, the Bayesian uh, examples were, and I think that's one reason that Bayesian took a little while to take off, is people say, well, 
yeah, you can do that for the easy math, but uh, you know that doesn't really extend to real world cases or things like that. Uh, or you can do the complicated math, and the complicated math can range from very difficult to impossible. And by impossible, I mean impossible, not just very, very difficult. Uh, some of these things, you know, would involve uh, integrating the normal distribution uh, over an, you know, arbitrary range, uh, which if anybody figures out how to do that, that's probably worth a PhD in math. Uh, because nobody's figured it out yet. Um, or, and what has really made Bayesian statistics take off in, in the last couple decades in that, is a computer and a lots of calculations can approximate the math. And so now that we have fast computers, uh, we can do this approach here. Um, and it's just opened up a lot of possibilities uh, because, you know, you now some of these things, some of these examples I, I did here, I did a fair number of iterations, and so it might have taken five or six minutes to, uh, to do a calculation, whereas, you know, fitting a, a regression using the RLM function would have only taken a second or less. Uh, but there are some flexibilities and, and some bonuses there. And as I had one professor point out one time, he says, if you're complaining about, you know, a couple hours of calculation time after spending two years collecting your data, your priorities are in the wrong place. So um, these things are down to, you know, five minutes or maybe a couple of hours if you're doing something really intensive. Uh, but that's, you know, still very doable compared to 20 years ago when it might have been a week uh, to do all the calculations. Um, so I think it's impossible there. Okay. Uh, so... Think about prior distributions. Now, for a long time, there was kind of this fallback position of the prior distribution. Uh, there are distributions that some people call the non-informative distributions to just say, I don't know anything. Uh, the true Bayesians really point out that, well, if you don't know anything about the parameter, then you shouldn't know anything about the square of the parameter or the log of the parameter or something else like that. And how can you use the same distribution for all those different lack of knowledge? So. They're trying to push away from not knowing anything. And I want to come up with kind of a, a demonstration to show that you can uh, get a lot of information even if you don't know anything. So this is kind of just my made-up example. But think about it here is we've uh, discovered a new island in the Pacific, and it's our, just, our job to estimate the mean heights of the men and women that live there. Uh, so what should our prior on the mean be? Okay, so this is a newly discovered island. Nobody's been there before. We're pretty prepared. They're going to go and they're going to measure the heights of a random sample of people on this island for us. What should my prior be on the mean height of men and women on this island? Well, I don't know anything about this island. And so I might be tempted to say, I'll just use this, this flat, non-informative prior that says it could really be anything. But if you start thinking about it, we do know some things. Uh, for one thing, I would be very, very surprised if the average height of people on this island was a negative number. Okay. Height, we're pretty sure, is positive, okay? But these non-informative priors say, you know, hey, it's equally likely to be negative one million as it is to be positive three, you know? So, um, you know, we do know some things. Uh, I actually went just onto Wikipedia, spent, you know, five, ten minutes. Actually, I spent longer, but that was because I kept getting distracted and looking at other things. So the useful time finding this out was around five minutes. Um, and there's this Wikipedia page that has studies that have been done all over the world in all these different countries, and it has the mean heights of men and women reported for all these different countries. And the, the lowest was 56 inches in height for uh, females in Bolivia, up to 73 inches in height, uh, someplace in the Dineric Alps, which I don't know what part of the Alps that is, but that's what it said, uh, for males there. So for the Wikipedia article, that gives us some information right there is it seems unlikely that the, uh, this new island would have an average height. You know, it might be outside of that range, but it's probably not going to be very, outside, very far outside of that range. Uh, you know, another quick Google search actually found that their world records uh, heights for adults is the, the world's shortest man was uh, 22 inches tall, and the world's tallest man was 97 inches tall. So I would be really unlikely to think that the average height of these new islanders would be outside of that range. Um, so with that, I said, well, let's look at a nice normal distribution. Normal's easy to work with. We're familiar with it in that. And I tried a few different values with round values in that. And I found if I said a mean of 65 inches and a standard deviation of 10 inches, then that gives me this curve here, which gives me about 60% of the area of the normal curve between that 56 and 73 which I already, you know, established as kind of the, the 
extreme means from that Wikipedia article, and then the, the world records down at 22 and 97 are really unlikely to be there. Um, if I wanted to, to give myself a little bit more wiggle room, uh, I could go with like a T distribution, uh, centered and rescaled, three degrees of freedom. Uh, now we're down to only 54% in here. Uh, but I am saying I'm going to give my prior estimation is I'm saying I have about 1.2% probability that the mean could be less than the world record shortest height and about a 2.5% probability that is greater than the world record height. So that would give me even more flexibility. So, and with the, the computational tools, it's not really that different whether I use the normal or the T or whatever. And so this is kind of representing. And so I can come up with a, a couple of prior distributions that really represent, you know, some knowledge with just a few minutes here of, you know, what's likely to be here. And I will actually get to some examples here that show actually how this benefits us uh, using this informative prior. And this is not a strong prior, um, it, but it just says, you know, it's not going to be negative. It's not going to be, uh, you know, really huge. It's going to be somewhere in that range. Okay. Uh, but I have another demonstration I want to show and uh, to kind of show the idea of updating uh, with this as we update our data. And so the idea here is think about, you know, we're working for NASA or somebody. We've sent out a deep space probe. Uh, we found an inhabitable planet. Uh, and one thing we're interested in is on this planet is what proportion of the surface is covered with land versus water uh, so that we can help prepare our invasion force, I mean our explor exploratory teams as they go and do this. Um, so here, here's our planet that we'll use to do the simulation. Uh, excuse me for a minute while I blow up the world. Okay, so the idea is as we do this is I, I will toss the, the, the globe, the ball here to somebody, uh, catch it, look where your left index finger lies, if it's on water or land, uh, if it's on an animal or a symbol or part way, use your best judgment in that. Uh, call that out to me and I've got my little tool here that I put together and so I'll record the data as we go and we'll do you know probably about 20 people do things here. But we'll actually see, so I'm starting off here with actually the uniform prior, that the proportion of, of land here uh, is between zero and one. And I'll, I'll show you the effects of using some other priors here in a minute. Uh, but we're going to start off, you know, before we know anything, it could be any value from zero to one, and I'm saying I don't know anything here. But as I add data in here, you'll see that it will update that prior to give a posterior, and essentially each step, the, the posterior becomes the new prior as we update a new uh, data point here. So. <laughs> Water. Water. <laughs> Water. Water. <laughs> Try not to break the equipment. <laughs> Three more. Um, water. water. Okay. Let's just stop there. Um, okay. So we'll do one more. So we, we, we had 13 waters and eight lands. And so now this is our 
posterior distribution, the, the gray line was the, the, just the previous step um, as we go through with this. But you see we've narrowed it down. So what's 8 divided by 21? It would be a little bit more than one-third or 30 percent. Um, so about 35 percent or so. Not exactly, but you can see our posterior here is now centered there. And it's really clear, I mean, even if we go back, and I'm going to roll this back to when we only had one data point here, our first data point was land, and so it immediately said the probability of there being 0% land is now 0. Okay, there's got to be at least some land because we saw some land, so it can't be 0%. Um, and it put more weight on there being, you know, high amounts of land uh, than not. Then as we increased a little bit more, uh, we got a water there, so now it can't be 0% land, but it can't be 100% land either. So it's got to be somewhere in the middle. And as we, you know, increased our data points, it represents the, the different amounts here. And so our, our posterior here is that, you know, so the, uh, we can look at the mean, the median, or the mode of the posterior. Actually, sometimes we look at, at all of those. But they're all around, you know, in that 35%. But then we could also look at kind of the, the central 80% or central 95% to get, you know, our interval estimate of where that proportion would be. With only 21 data points, um, you know, we're not going to narrow it down a, a whole lot. If we kept doing this, we'd get, you know, more and more precision. Uh, but I also want to show kind of the effect of some of the uh, different priors we could have used. So I have this tab here, and this is all using the data that you guys just helped me collect here. Um, so this was the uniform prior, and so the rightmost panel is the posterior for that. If we came down here, and this was a, a beta prior that said, well, I don't think it's the extremes, uh, but I think it's somewhere in the middle. And you can see our posterior here is actually a little bit narrower uh, than it was with the uniform because our data and our prior matched, and it said, oh, that, that information we have, it makes it a little bit narrower. Uh, but we could use a prior, you know, so this is a beta prior with a, a U-shape where I'm starting off saying I think it's, there's a high probability that it's all water or all land and only a little bit of probability that it's somewhere in the middle. Um, but the data contradicted my prior and said, no, it, you know, with about 35%, um, we really think it's here. Uh, but if we looked at those carefully, you'd actually see that they're spread, that one they have spread out a little bit more from that. Uh, but we could put in lots of different priors where I think, you know, it's mostly water or mostly land. And those are going to affect the posterior a little bit. But there's kind of this effect is when we don't have very much data at all, the prior really uh, plays into this a lot. But as we get more and more data, the prior becomes less and less important and the data really drives it. Um, yeah, I have a couple of those. The exception, though, is if I have zero prior probability, it will force zero posterior probability as well. So here's a prior where I said, uh, I think there's zero percent chance that it's less than 50 percent land and equal for anything above that. And so you can see when we get to the posterior, it has a hard cutoff there because when you multiply by zero, it stays zero. So we can't have anything there. So it tried to pile up as much of that probability mass as it could against that 0.5. Because the data suggests that it's less than 50% land, at, but my prior said that it has to be at least 50% land. So here my posterior is piling up as much as it can against that 50% boundary, um, just to try and reconcile those as much as possible. Um, here I did the other way, where I say it has to be less than 50% land, and that matches a lot more. Sorry, here. You do see it kind of does this little cutoff here, but there wasn't a lot of... of area there anyways. So this will, the, the mode isn't affected very much, but the mean by forcing this part to be zero, it will move the mean of the posterior down a little bit, which is one of the reasons it's actually good to look at the mean, the median, and the mode for all of these, okay? Uh, this is a Laplace prior that has kind of a pointy center, and you can see it gives the more pointy there. Or we could have even done a discrete prior, where here I'm saying I, I have probabilities associated with you know, 10%, 20%, 30%, but I've got zero for, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14%. So I'm only going to let it put posterior mass at certain points, and I get a posterior that looks similar here. It's still centering here highest at about 40, 
30 and 40 percent, um, and lower around there. So we, we can do different things with with those and, and compared kind of the effects of the, the priors on a lot of those different things. I showed it there. Okay, uh, so let's actually look at this. Um, moving away from that, going back to the, the height data, you know, if we're thinking about the, this island here, um, I actually took a, a sample of 10 and a sample of 1,000, each of men and women, uh, just from the NHANES data set to represent what we find on this island. Uh, and I compared it to what we'd get from a, a, a traditional uh, t test here. Uh, so with a sample size of 10, so not very much data. Uh, the t-test said that the average of my data set was 70.2, uh, but a confidence interval that, that it could be anywhere from 76.6 to 72.8 uh, for the males. Uh, the Bayes approach using the, the normal prior that I showed, which carries some information but not a huge amount of information, uh, gave me an estimate of 70.1. Remember that prior it had its mean at 65. So it did pull the mean down slightly, but not by very much. Uh, and the Bayesian interval, Bayesians like to call it a credible interval instead of a confidence interval, just so that they're not using the same terminology as, as frequentists, I think. Um, uh, but you can see that they're actually fairly comparable here where everything matches nicely. So for females, we have the 62.7 and 62.7. Those actually match a lot closer. And I can look at the, the difference here, um, you know, so this would be the two sample t-test versus for the Bayesian model here, um, and I can show you the actual code I used. Uh, I basically, I fit a normal distribution to the males and a separate normal distribution to the females, but then I said, uh, for the posterior means, show me the difference. Um, and so you see, you know, very similar but not exactly matching for that. Uh, when we get to 1,000 data points, they are actually much closer to each other. Um, if you go at a few more data point, for a few more decimal points, they don't match exactly, but the data is really dominating the prior here, and so you're not going to see much difference uh, between these things here. Okay? Uh, here's the actual posterior distributions when I do this. So X was the males, Y was the females. Probably should have done that the other way, but as so you can see here, so before I had kind of the mean and the interval, but here you can see the old whole distribution. Uh, this height data was reasonably normal, so using the normal model made sense. And so you can see the posteriors here uh, came out looking pretty normal as well. So this is for the males, this is for the females. This is the difference, uh, but with the Bayesian, I also did a ratio uh, because I was interested there. Now, in frequentist statistics, it's taking the ratio of two things from a normal distribution is one of the hard problems uh, that we deal with. And so, especially in intro classes, we just kind of gloss over that and say, just use the differences and don't worry about ratios um, or do that things. Here, this was one additional line in the, the Bayesian code to just say, take my, my current estimate of the mean for the males divided by my current estimate of the mean for the females, and then show me this uh, estimated distribution from that. And so we can get the ratio here that it's a little bit more than 1.1 is the, the ratio between the males, at the average height male estimation for, average estimated height for the males versus females. Um, so that's, you know, one of the flexibilities that come out nicely with a, a Bayesian approach um, uh, is you know, if I want the ratio, I just say, show me the ratio. And it kind of does everything automatically there. So it's kind of nice there. Okay. Um, it's good when doing the Bayesian to do what's called the, uh, uh, diagnostic of the posterior prediction. And so what we can do here is this is actually a, uh, the histogram here is essentially so, you know, I'm using a behind the scenes, I'm using the Monte Carlo Markov chain methodology to estimate that posterior. And so here what I did is I just say take the, um, uh, each estimate of that posterior, each draw from that posterior, I have a mean and a standard deviation for the males. And I say generate a random normal value with that mean and standard deviation. And I do that for each of those draws. And so that's kind of my estimate of kind of like a, a prediction interval, but a whole distribution of saying, well, if I choose another male from this island, what do I predict his height will be? And so the histogram 
gives me that distribution, and then the 10 blue lines are the actual heights of the males that were in this data set. And so we can see that they are centered nicely. We, we do have a few pieces out here where there is some data. Uh, there's a whole bunch of iterations here, and so, you know, we do have some data out in the, some predictions out in the tail saying it could be, you know, way out here. We just didn't observe this because this is only 10 people. And so this tells me that, you know, my model is probably reasonable, that my data is not contradicting, you know, the actual observed data isn't contradicting my predictions of what should have happened. And this is now the females that look similar. This is the males where I have all 1,000 uh, samples here. So you can see a lot of density here in the middle. Getting through out here, I jittered them a little bit, but it's still kind of dense there. Um, we are seeing a few observed values out here in the tails, but the tail does extend out there, so it's, they're not surprising at all. Okay, and then the females again with 1,000. Okay, uh, there's some other plots we can do fairly automatically. Uh, so for all of these, I actually used uh, the package rstan, which is an interface between R and another program called stan. Uh, the where I do everything in R, uh, the, the package then packages up the data the right way, sends it to stan, stan does all the computations, sends the results back to R, and then R makes all the nice plots and, and all of that as well. Um, so here we can see these are kind of estimates, and unfortunately the, the bottom of the plot got cut off, so we don't have an axis here. But here's kind of a, a mean and interval for, so there's the mean of the males, the mean of the females, the standard deviation of the, the males, the standard deviation of the females, the difference, and the ratio. Uh, so this is, this is just the, the kind of the default plot. If I say, you know, my, my object that I created, uh, I just say plot that. This is the plot that came out. Uh, there's also the density. I can do what's called the trace plot. This is showing the, uh, uh, what happened over time. It would actually ran four different chains simultaneously. Uh, there's some nice diagnostics that come out by doing multiple chains as well as you can see that they match each other. Uh, mostly these are kind of just randomly bouncing around, which is what we expect to see. And so, uh, you know, nothing really... To, to be concerned about from there. If you, if you see it getting kind of stuck in an area or switching somewhere, then you need to worry that, well, maybe it didn't mix long enough, maybe I didn't do enough iterations, uh, and you'll look at things, but where it's just random all over the place, that's what we hope to see. Here's uh, kind of the, the standard output. So for each of these variables, um, it gives me the mean of the posterior, uh, the standard deviation of the posterior. I haven't quite figured out what this standard error piece here is, is what we usually think of the standard standard error is more the standard deviation. It also gives me some of the, the quantiles. So I've got the median there at the 50%. Um, I can get that credible interval by looking at the 2.5 and 97.5. Uh, then it also gives this N effective is an effective sample size because the way it's sampling is there is some autocorrelation in there. Um, and so it actually can compute that autocorrelation and it says that while I ran this, I think there were total of 20,000 iterations is that because of the autocorrelation, it's effectively about 14,000, um, which is, is still pretty good. Uh, you know, if, if this number is only a couple of hundred, then you know it's not mixing very well. It's over 10,000 uh, for each of these, so, you know, that's usually plenty for this. And then this R hat is another diagnostic where it compares uh, between those different chains. And those different chains all started with different initial values. And if you have something that, that where your model isn't well specified, we could have one chain that started up here and stays up here, and another chain that starts down here and stays down here, and the data isn't able to correct that. And so it says, well, kind of how does that variation within a chain compare between chains? And if these numbers are all really close to one, then we're happy that, uh, you know, we've got a good model and things are doing that. If as they get further and further apart from one, then there's room for concern there. Uh, so there's just kind of some of the output. Okay. Uh, now I wanted to think and say, well, what is the benefit of having that prior? Because we saw the t-test and the Bayesian didn't really have much uh, difference effect. Uh, so I went back and I, I redid the same analysis, but in the NHANES data, the data actually came in centimeters, not inches, but my prior was specified in inches. So I went back and reanalyzed it. So for the first example, I converted to inches and, you know, divide by 2.54 and round it off. Um, here I left it as centimeters. 
And so I think I'm measuring in height, me measuring height in inches, but it's actually coming to me in centimeters. Well, the t-test is just happy and oblivious. It doesn't know anything about the prior information. And it says, well, the average height is 178.4, uh, um, but that's in, in centimeters. If I try to interpret that as inches, that is really, really tall. Okay. Uh, the Bayes one, you can see it actually pulled it back to 73.7, but gave a, a really wide confidence interval here. And actually, the Bayesian estimate of the standard deviation is 120, whereas the actual standard deviation of the data was 3.6. So you can see it, it kind of said, well, how can I reconcile this, this prior that's over here and this data that's over here? And it says, well, there must be a really big standard deviation because I didn't really put any, you know, very strong restriction on the standard deviation. And you really see that when we look at that posterior plot, uh, so posterior predictive plot. The posterior predictive plot says, well, if, if my prior and my data model and my data are all correct and agree with each other, then it's predicting that I should be getting, you know, future heights anywhere from the, the negative 250s up to positive 300. And again, that's from that standard deviation where I actually saw data was, you know, right there. And so this tells me something went wrong. And so having that prior in there and looking at this diagnostic plot gives me that warning that, okay, some, there's some mismatch. Now, this one is easy. It's inches versus centimeters. Uh, but if I had not caught on to that mistake and reported, you know, the average height of these people is 174 inches, uh, you know, I would be embarrassed later on when somebody pointed out that there was a problem there. Okay. Um, I can also kind of, you know, one of the classic problems in uh, statistics for, you know, the two-sample t-test is, well, what do we do if we don't believe that our two populations have the same variance? So there are tests we can do, and we can do, you know, Satterthwaite approximations to the degrees of freedom, which is a great formula to scare intro uh, stats students with. You know, you, you put that formula up, and they start panicking, and then you say, it's like, I'm only showing this to you to say, we make the computer do this, and you don't have to, and then they say, there's a big sigh of relief, you know. You know, there's all these things. Uh, in my analysis, I just said estimate the standard deviation for the males, estimate a different standard deviation for the females, and the Bayesian thing just went along with it fine. And because of the way working with that posterior distribution, instead of trying to force it to fit a T distribution, it was able to give me good estimates without needing these complicated formulas for dealing with, uh, you know, unequal estimated uh, variances. So here, I just took those variance estimates, or the standard deviation estimates, squared them to make them variance estimates, um, took the ratio of those, and this is the histogram of those draws from the posterior of the ratio of the variances. So the green line's at one, and the blue line's at the, you know, this is the central 95% between the two blue lines. And so we could take that and we could say, well, it looks like the variance, and I did variance of males over variance of females, does look like, you know, probably the, the variance of the males is a little bit bigger than that of the females. Um, but one isn't something that we would rule out either, uh, that they are exactly the same. But we really don't have to worry about it the same as uh, we do in some of the, the standard frequencies things, okay? Uh, well, what if we have a non-normal case, okay? Uh, in frequentists, uh, we generally say, well, if we've got a big enough sample size, we'll use the central limit theorem, um, and we can approximate everything with the normal. Uh, now, there are Bayesian kind of central limit theorems that as you get more data, a lot of the posteriors will look normal in that as well. Uh, but here's a simple case where instead of looking at the, um, the heights, when you look at the weights, they're actually right skewed. Uh, so I fit a similar model, but I used, instead of a normal distribution, I used a gamma distribution. And the gamma distribution, so there's an alpha parameter and a beta parameter, and then from those, I calculated what the mean is. And so... Uh, I did convert this as weight in pounds, I believe, for you know, a similar data set here. So we, we have a mean estimated weight here of uh, 197 pounds um, and a you know, corresponding uh, credible interval in that as well. And it's just, you know, it's almost the same code. I just plugged in, uh, you know, in where before I had normal for the likelihood, I put in gamma and then, you know, different parameterization. But if we're using non-normal, but we have a distribution we like, it's easy to just plug that in, okay? Now, this is the posterior predictive now for weights. So this is a, for 1,000 males. Uh, the blue line is the density estimate of the original data. The histogram is the posterior predictive of saying, 
what would I predict for the next mail to, uh, to look like. And other than this little bump that is kind of missing, there is some data out there, uh, but we might have that. They actually, I think, match pretty well to say that actually, you know, it was kind of a guess on my part. It's like, okay, I know the data is going to be right skewed. Um, gammas are right skewed. Let's see how it fits. Uh, but I think I actually got kind of lucky here that a, a gamma seems to fit this really well. Uh, it looks like in the data there are some outliers, so I might want to do maybe a mixture of gammas uh, to account for some unusual cases. Okay. Um, if I want to do something like a logistic regression, again, I'm just kind of showing you a quick output here because we're, we're running out of time. But again, I'll post the R Markdown file that has all the code I did to run these. Uh, so you can run it yourself, or uh, and then you can also go in and tweak things and run it yourself here. Um, but this this was a data set. This is one of the data sets built into R on esophageal cancer. Uh, so the, the Y variable here was essentially a uh, count of, of people, this was actually a case control study, but so it's the count of people who did have esophageal cancer uh, versus those who, who didn't um, based on, so the first X was kind of an age variable, uh, a variable measuring how much alcohol they drank and uh, a variable how much tobacco they used. Um, and so these are essentially just the slopes, but it's kind of nice in here is now I just said Y follows a binomial distribution and Stan has built in with the, the logit, based on the logit transform. So it's a binomial distribution based on the logit transform of beta naught plus beta one times x one plus beta two times x two plus beta three times x three. Actually, it just has x times beta because Stan can do matrix multiplication. So I have, in the code, it's just, you know, this beta underscore logit, the n sample size variable, and then beta naught plus x times beta. And that's the whole likelihood piece, and Stan knows what to do with that, does all the right updating in that. Um, I, I, put, I think I put Cauchy priors on these just to kind of say, well, they're probably closer to zero than, than really big, huge numbers, but if I guess wrong, the Cauchy has kind of heavy tells that could put stuff out there. Uh, but So here's my, my slope estimates, and these are really close to what, uh, you know, if you look at the help page for the data set, it has an example uh, of a, you know, a, using the GLM function in R, and we get similar types of results. Um, then I could just actually add to this if I want to include interactions or other things. Um, this is actually probably not the best model, but it fits on the screen well because uh, these are actually, the X variables here are categorical, and I just converted them back to numeric as kind of a, you know, a rough estimate here. But, you know, we can see a lot with that. And then here's the, posterior distributions, uh, so we can see, you know, none of them uh, have very much uh, probability near zero, uh, so it looks like all three of those variables, alcohol, age, uh, tobacco, uh, influence uh, the esophageal cancer, um, and we can kind of see some relative sizes on those. Okay. Um, another thing I like is the, the multiple comparison problem. Uh, I like the Bayesian approach to here. Uh, so just to, this is just using some simulated data here. So what I did is I simulated 10 groups, each with a sample of size 30, mean 100, standard deviation 5. So there are no real differences in uh, the original data here. But then I looked at all the pairwise comparisons, okay? So with, with 10 groups, there's uh, close to 50 uh, possible comparisons. So it's not surprising if you don't adjust for multiple comparisons to get something significant just by chance. Um, and so we did that. So if you look at the uncorrected, if you just look at the biggest difference without correcting for multiple comparisons, uh, then the difference is 102 versus 98, which is a difference of 3.69, and the confidence interval on that is 1.07 to 6.3. So that would say, well, this is that's significantly bigger than zero. There's a difference here. Uh, the classic Tukey comparison or Tukey method says, well, there's multiple comparisons here. So to account for that, we're going to increase the standard deviation. So the difference is the same, the two means are the same, but now it increases the standard deviation enough to say, oh, my confidence interval includes zero. So if my biggest difference could be zero, there's probably really no differences there. So Tukey does the right thing in saying, hey, there's not a real difference. Um, but it's still not completely satisfying uh, because it's just increasing the standard deviation and we have less precise there. Uh, the Bayesian hierarchical model Instead, what it does is instead of taking the, the raw data 
or the raw mean of each group, is it says, well, what if all these means come from a distribution, but that distribution has its own hierarchical prior? And so it tries to fit there. And so what it does is it actually shrinks those extreme means back towards the center as well. So it does a regression towards the mean effect as well. And so we get a, a credible interval here that includes zero, but our difference is also probably a little bit more meaningful as to saying, well, this 102, because this is simulated data, I know that these are as extreme as they are due to pure chance. And so the Bayesian hierarchical model says, well, I'll, I'll take into account the data, but I'll take into account that these things could be more similar to each other and, and things look extreme by chance, and it shrinks them back in towards that overall mean. And so these means are going to be closer to the truth than just these observed ones. And so I still get my correction for multiple comparisons, but it's kind of a natural byproduct rather than having to go in and, and increase the standard deviation. Okay. Um, one, one more example. This, this is based on simulated data, but uh, some real problems that I did similar to this is here we have uh, 10 different clinics and we're looking at their success rate. And we wanted to look at, at how, uh, how those relate to each other. But some of the clinics, so this number up here is the sample size we're working with. So the smallest clinic, we only had 10 observations uh, from there, uh, whereas the biggest clinic, we had 1,000 observations. And, uh, you know, when you're comparing clinics like this, there's sometimes it's like, well, hey, if I only got 10 observations, one bad outcome is going to increase my percentage by 10%, whereas you know, for the 1,000, one unusual case doesn't have much of an effect as, as well. Um, the green line here is if we just kind of pooled everything together. It's pulled down here because the, these with really high um, proportions uh, or really high sample sizes are going to pull down more than these with the lower ones. But fitting is a hierarchical model where we say, okay, each of these percentages, we're going to fit a percentage to each clinic, but we're also going to say that they come from a, a a hierarchical distribution with its own parameters that we're going to estimate. And so we get this, again, this regression to this mean or this pulling here. And you can see the really extreme values get pulled more. The small sample size ones get pulled more. This one doesn't get pulled very much at all because we have a thousand cases there. Um, but we're borrowing strength where we don't have a lot of data. We're pulling those towards the overall mean to gain additional data from their neighbors, from other things as well. And we get the, the actual proportion I simulated at, I think was around 35% or something, which the, the blue line does a good job of, of estimating. Um, so again, you can look at all those. Okay, so just some of the quick advantages and disadvantages of Bayesian approach is Bayesian tends to be a lot more flexible uh, you can do some of these things with a frequentist, but not with kind of the standard tools. You have to go into maximum likelihood and remember your calculus and do things like that. Whereas the Bayesian, uh, the tools have been developed well enough that it's a lot easier to, to put that flexibility in and then it estimates all the calculus using the MCMC. Okay? We can incorporate the prior information. Um, we're not stuck with just the normal distribution. It's easy to put in other distributions. Um, it does require more thought. I think that's actually an advantage rather than a disadvantage, but you know, if, if, if you don't want to think, that could be considered a disadvantage. But you do need to kind of think through, what is my likelihood, what are my priors, what information do I have? So it does require a little bit there. Um, it's not as standard yet, so if you want to publish something, you might have to give a little bit more explanation rather than just saying, we did a t-test or we did a regression, you have to explain a little bit more. Um, and you know, sometimes uh, the analysis time is longer though I've had some frequentist analyses that have, have stalled on me and have been taking forever. And, you know, the Bayesian actually still just took, you know, half an hour or so. Okay. Uh, if you want to learn more, two books that I really recommend. The Theory That Would Not Die is kind of, it's, it's a, a lighter but historical look at how Bayesian statistics developed back from uh, the Reverend Thomas Bayes in the 1700s up to uh, current things. Um, this textbook, Statistical Rethinking by, by Richard McElreath, I really like it. The thing I like most about it is he has lots of examples, provides all of his R code, um, and he actually has everything provided on his website, including he's taught a class a couple of times based on his book. Uh, he recorded those, and you can watch videos of him teaching the class for free from his website. 
So you can get, get a whole free class. So those are what I would recommend there. Uh, our packages, there's a Bayesian task view on CRAN, which has a whole big long list. That's a comprehensive one. Uh, rethinking goes with that book. Um, Brugs, R2 win bugs, and win bugs are all interfaces to the open bugs or win bugs. Again, external things. Uh, RSTAN is the one that I'm using most nowadays. Uh, interfaces with the STAN program, which compiles to C++ code, so it tends to run quicker than the bugs approaches. Uh, a newer package, as pure R, is Nimble, which it also compiles C++, but it's the R code that writes the C++ and then compiles it, where this sends the code to STAN, which creates the C++ code and compiles it. Um, BRMS and RSTAN are ARM are actually kind of wrappers around the R STAN, which give you a model function that looks like LM and GLM and AOV, um, but then it writes the code to send to R STAN and gets the output back to you. So running these are almost the same as the standard R code. Uh, interpreting is you still have the Bayesian output instead of that. Uh, and then the LOO package for leave one out uh, does cross validation from some of these other things to help you with some model diagnostics to say, does my model really fit my data? How well does it do at predicting a, a new data point? Uh, and so that's another one there. So those are kind of my recommendations of kind of the R place to look. Again, I will get this posted somewhere so you can go through and look through all my code in that, okay? And it, so I did give you a lot of time for questions, but we have about five minutes, so. Great, thank you. Um, okay, the, the question was, looking at the, the land versus water when we were spinning the globe in that, was how would a frequentist approach that, and probably what is the advantage of Bayesian in that case, you're saying? Um, well, I mean, we could have done that as a frequentist. We could have just plugged into the binomial distribution, found a maximum likelihood estimate, done a confidence interval uh, based on that. Um, there's actually you know, uh, a lot of things, our data is probably not big enough to do the normal approximation of the binomial in there, so we'd want to do one of the other ones. Um, that, that's an example where, I mean, kind of the nice thing there was kind of showing how the Bayesian, you, you can update with each new data point. Um, the final answer for the, the uniform prior and doing as a frequentist would have been pretty similar, okay, because that, that was pretty straightforward there. Uh, the big Bayesian advantage there is using, uh, you know, that we could put in different priors if we had some additional information is the frequentist approach is al almost always just going to say, let's look at the data, plug it into the binomial distribution, get a, uh, an interval out of that. And there's not a, a nice, simple way to plug in that, well, other planets we've discovered have had, uh, you know, the per percent land in, in this range, and we think this one is going to be similar. So we can put in the different priors to to do that. That's probably the big advantage for, for that particular case. Um, I do also like that um, I, I find myself actually using that model for when I just need a confidence interval or a credible interval for a proportion uh, because I think the Bayesian approach, it behaves a lot nicer as you're close to boundaries. Okay, If you're in the middle between you know 20 and 80 percent, you're not going to see a lot of difference as that. Uh, but if you're looking at, at rare events, um, uh, the, the Bayesian confidence interval, I think, b behaves the, the best, where you, it's actually it's a, a beta prior, uh, or a uniform is a special case of the beta, but a, a beta prior and then a binomial likelihood, uh, you get some really well-behaved intervals, even if you haven't observed any failures. You know, I've, I've had some data sets where it's like, you know, we've done this procedure a hundred times, we succeeded a hundred times, but we want a confidence interval for our failure rate, okay? You, you plug that into your STAT 101 formula and it all blows up because you're dividing by a zero estimated standard deviation. You plug it in here and it gives you a meaningful, uh, credible interval. Yeah. I, so related to that, um, in all my interactions with um, people of Bayesian persuasion, um, <laughs> I, I've had people say like, like, oh, you're misunderstanding the credible interval. Like it's so different on a philosophical level, right? Like from like what your understanding of confidence intervals is or whatever. Um, 
what um, uh, may, maybe this is too much to try to get into, but like, like what? So if you could say um, succinctly, like what, like what, what is a good way to understand the Bayesian credible interval? Well. I, and here's where I differ some, from some of the pure, pure Bayesians, is I think that once you get into the, the you know, common sense interpretation of the confidence interval, where we're saying, you know, I, I'm, you know, don't interpret it as a probability, but it's really representing my lack of knowledge, you're almost getting into the Bayesian definition of probability there. And when you take the Bayesian credible interval and, and think about, okay, simplifying and basic, I don't think they're that different, because they're both representing our, our lack of knowledge. Here's what I do know, here's what I don't know. Bayesians say it in terms of, well, it's part, you know, it's, it's a posterior probability. Um, frequentists say, well, it's this confidence, which is kind of saying, uh, you know, probability, but after the probability has occurred. And, you know, I think when you get into the layman's terms of, of really understanding what they're both saying, I think those two move to be pretty much the same thing. Um, you do need to recognize that, you know, the Bayesian's gonna be influenced by choice of prior and so, you know, Bayesians say, well, you know, don't look at the, the same coverage. You know, frequentists like to say, well, I can simulate this and I can produce a thousand confidence intervals and 95% of them contain the true mean. Bayesians, for some reason, balk at doing that, even though their intervals would do that the same, unless they put in a really strong prior. Um, uh, now, if they put in a really strong prior that's correct, they'll actually have better coverage. But if they put in a really strong prior that's incorrect, it will ruin that coverage, and maybe that's why. Uh, but I, I don't see them that different. Right. And, and maybe that's because I'm, I haven't had enough Bayesian stuff pounded in my head, or maybe it's because I'm a pragmatist and see them both as useful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. So we're right at one right now, so we'll wrap it up. Maybe Greg can be uh, around for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, another 